can change the world One life, one heart, one soul, one mind Right here on Rainmakers, we have people from all walks of life who have done great things around the world. And today is no different, except this is about an entrepreneurial journey along the way of doing something great. Anisha Shankar from Tansa Clean, right here on Rainmakers. Welcome. Thank you. You're an entrepreneur. <laughs> I thought entrepreneurs were supposed to be dressed like me and have suits and ties and be, you know, a deal in you know, eight-figure finance. <laughs> well, um, I think I'm just making it up as I go along. So um, I suppose you could call me an entrepreneur, but I'm, I'm essentially following the thing that I really want to do. And as an entrepreneur, you, you got to have an idea about doing something that's going to make a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And you certainly have something that uh, is addressing a huge problem. Tell us a little bit about it. So, um, so essentially, there's a sanitation crisis in India. Um, there's, uh, and this is happening at many levels. Um, about 600 million Indians defecate in the open. Um, there's, um, there are breakdowns in the treatment infrastructure. And all of this you know, fecal pollution out there results in huge losses of life um, environmental damage and economic losses across the Indian economy. Um, so uh, 400,000 children under the age of five in India die each year from diarrhea-related causes. So this isn't something that's just a matter of being in bad taste. This is something that has a, a huge impact on health. Huge impact on health. And so those are the children that die, and then there are children that are stunted. They're malnourished because um, they're exposed to so much fecal contamination every day um, that they simply can't absorb nutrition even when they have access to mm -hmm. food. But there are a lot of educated people in India, certainly one of the most educated countries uh, in the world in terms of, of numbers. Uh, there's a lot of money in India. There are some very, very wealthy people there. Mm -hmm. There are some beautiful houses. There's some strong infrastructure. There's also some less than strong infrastructure. But why is this happening? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think um, the government has made it the priority. I mean, they certainly speak about it, but I don't think it's the priority that it needs to be in India. Um, and, um, and so I tend to focus less on, on the fact that there are these missing pieces in India. Um, because to me, that's very frustrating to say, well, the government's not doing this. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I approach it is, well, the government's not doing it, so why am I not doing something about it? And essentially, that's how I got started on this. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't live in India now, right? I do not live in India. I live in Seattle, Washington. Um, and um, but but so so it's in, so it's an interesting um, it, it's interesting. I had to leave India to know what I wanted to do to contribute to India, and I guess that's how it works sometimes. <laughs> well, uh, help me understand it because in terms of your entrepreneurial journey, yeah. as people who might have an entrepreneurial bent in them are watching this, yeah. uh, are you suggesting that um, you know if they've got something they want to do in Pittsburgh or they want to do in Paris, they should leave it and then look at it from a distance? No, so, so my journey, um, so I grew up in India um, um, and, and um, grew up uh, you know privileged because I had access to all the education and, and uh, a quality of life that 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 was fabulous, um, and so. Uh, but I came to the U.S. I wanted to do, um, do some graduate work, and I um, did a degree, a master's degree in communication, and then a, another degree in environmental and energy policy at the University of Delaware, um, and and it was it was fabulous, and then I. Um, I start. I when when we moved to Seattle, I was working um, at an environmental consulting firm. I loved it. Was learning a lot, and and everything that I learned, I, I kept thinking, well, I I'm building all these fabulous skills, but where it's where the skills are needed, that's not where they are. And so always in the back of my mind, I was thinking, how do I how do I actually go back and 
do something and do something positive and valuable in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's kind of the 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 backstory. And finally, in 2011, um, I got a fellowship to go work in India for six um, months, and was working on a uh, on a nutrition plus entrepreneurship uh, project in mm -hmm. um, in um, the, the these are highly impoverished areas of the city where where I am from, uh, the city of Pune. And uh, so when I finished that, I came back and I said, you know what? This is the time. It's it's time. I now have to actually stop talking and start doing something. And so I um, so I decided to get get on this entrepreneurship journey. Mm -hmm. And your goal is not to be a lobbyist to try to get the government to do something. Your goal is actually to do something you yes. know, yourself. Well, you've got this great graphic. It's it's just a word graphic, but but yeah. it's, it's in a video of yours, and it really kind of kind of puts things together. It's, it's, you know, it's got these great things like poop and hands and flies and water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, we kind of giggle. Yeah. But uh, again, 400,000 children dying under the age of five in India is nothing to laugh at. Nope, not at all. Um, so, so how does it all work together and what are you trying to do to fix it? Yeah, so, you know, I got started, the, the, the figure that, um, that, that really got me was the fact that, um, you know, about half of India's population defecates out in the open. And that's where I got started. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and yet, um, there are more people in India that have a cell phone than have a toilet. Um, so it made me think, well, why is that? And mm -hmm. what I settled on was um, a cell phone is a way for people to connect with their customers. So it's an actual way to earn an income. Yeah. Whereas a toilet, um, a toilet doesn't, you know, on the face of it, doesn't really do anything. It's very convenient, and it's, it's, you know, for women, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a way to, you know, relieve themselves safely if they have a to access to a toilet. Um, so, to me, it came down to economics. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, I got to ask you a question. What did you mean by that? A way to relieve themselves safely. What's the unsafe part? So, um, so women um, that. So when women have to defecate in the open, they normally do it in the dark. So they'll do it at dawn or they do it at dusk because it's um, because they they're modest and they don't want to be out in the open and mm -hmm. seen mm -hmm. defecating, um, and which leaves them um, which leaves them um, essentially vulnerable to um, to molestation and sexual predation mm -hmm. and you know attack by um, scorpions and snakes and. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and so again, this is a topic that that you know teenagers will giggle about and ten year olds will giggle about, but uh, it's a real problem, yeah. and it's something then that are people saying we need this to change. I think um, yes, yes, there are some there. There is some movement in the government. Uh, so there's the Millennium Development Goals mm -hmm. um, that that India has signed on to, um, it, it's hard to see the, the nationwide movement towards that. Um, so yes, people, are, people know that it has to change. Uh, but I think the problem is so huge that you need many different solutions that come in at many different levels in that, you know, that sanitation chain mm -hmm. that can actually make a difference. And that's what that's, so we, Tansa Clean, is basically coming in at one point in that sanitation chain. We're starting at one point. Who knows where we'll go from there. To show the enormity of the problem, there's an article, uh, thank you very much for forwarding it to me. It's uh, from October 21st, uh, 2013, and it's entitled The Throneless, and we're going to be sure to get the, the link up on the screen. But it said that there's 64% of Indians um, defecate in the, in the open. Mm -hmm. That means that the number of Indians who defecate in the open is about twice the entire population of the United States. So this is indeed a huge, a huge problem. Yes. And not one where we're, we are, should be looking down, but instead you, you talk about it from a health standpoint. So what is Tansa Clean proposing to do? Yeah, so, um, so we um, thought about this a lot. You know, the, the need is, you know, you, you think that the need is immediately for toilets, you know, give people toilets, um, but 
There are organizations that are already doing that. And it's a very hard sell. It's very hard to convince someone, you should do this because it's good for you. Um, instead, we want to just use the economic argument. And that's why we're focused on processing the waste that is mm -hmm. being generated. So we've kind of moved away from the individual user all the way to mass generation and mass processing. So what we want to do um, is be able to insert ourselves into a point in that chain where we think we have some leverage. And what that is, um, is there are, um, now Indian cities are growing really, really fast, but municipalities cannot keep up in terms of providing sewerage connections to all these new, new buildings. So these new buildings tend to use septic tanks or some kind of containment device for the waste that's being generated mm. in the building. Now those tanks have to be emptied fairly regularly. And that's where these vacuum tanker trucks, mm -hmm. a lot of them are owned by municipalities, a lot of them are actually owned by entrepreneurs who provide the service of emptying the septic tanks. Mm -hmm. And those are the big yellow trucks? Yes, yeah. yellow trucks. And, and then in, in India, I think there's a mixture. I think they tend to be little trucks actually, um, and they tend to be um, uh, basically fabricated and, and put together. So they, they carry, uh, what is it, four, cubic meters, I think it is. I, I'm pretty sure that's right. So anyway, so these trucks will come by, they empty the septic tank, and that's when the system starts to break down because they don't ha have a guaranteed place where they can go and drop off the material. They can take it to a sewage treatment plant, but they have to pay for it. But if they have to pay for it, that means it's eating into their revenues. So these, it's, it, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lack of regulation. So they just dump it on the ground and it gets into the groundwater and into, gets into the rivers. Right, right. Oh my gosh. Yes, so, but we think, so, but we look at this very positively. We say, well, the waste is already on wheels here. So we can, all we have to do is redirect. We just have to take, so instead of them going to the nearest river, we want to send them to the closest biodigester. Now, I mm -hmm. learned about biodigesters when I was in school and I was absolutely, I thought it was magic. You put a waste material in, and what you get out of it is um, biogas, which is mostly methane, mm -hmm. and a compost slurry, both great products. So um, what we want to do is send these trucks to the closest biodigester so that the digester actually breaks down the material, transforms this pathogenic material into a non-pathogenic, pathogen-free material, and methane, which can then be converted into electricity. Wow, sounds like a fantastic idea. What's the economics of it? Well, um, so we're not, we're not entirely sure. We think we can actually have digesters. This is all a big experiment. Mm -hmm. And we are very, I mean, we're very open about saying that. It's mm -hmm. an experiment. We want to see if digesters can generate enough gas output to sell back as electricity to the grid where they will pay for this material and the idea is digesters pay us to to be that connector and then we incentivize the truck drivers to so it'll be a second small source of revenue for the truck drivers to make this delivery to the digesters mm -hmm. now um, we think we've had conversations with biodigest operators, and we think that this is a model that can work. Mm -hmm. As we talk about the start of the show, the show is about an entrepreneurial journey. Yes. And at the same point in time, you are addressing a very, very big uh, problem that's a health problem, that's an environmental problem, uh, and you're turning it into uh, changing an economic problem yes. uh, that you have. But part of being an entrepreneur is, it sounds like, not knowing all the answers. It's definitely being comfortable not knowing all the answers. And, I, and, and at first I was, you know, I used to be hesitant to say I don't know. And I've just realized that I'm gonna be true to me and say, I don't know. If you have the answer, I would love to hear it. But to me, this is all about actually getting on the ground and testing it mm -hmm. and actually talking to people and figuring out what is going to work. We, we, it has to be people like me that 
step forward and, and you know, take the chance. And, and that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. All right, again, part of the entrepreneurial journey is that you can't necessarily do it all by yourself. You're an Indian by birth, living in Seattle, Washington. Where's your partner from? Yeah, so this is this is kind. Of, it's kind of a crazy. It's 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 very international. Um, so Mario Verón is my partner. He's a Colombian. He lives in Barranquilla, Colombia. Mm -hmm. um, we met in India. We did um, the same fellowship, different project, same fellowship. And when I met him, um, he's he's a lot younger than me. He's. Uh, I was so impressed that he is. Um, he's. Um, Fearless, he's really committed to seeing um, social enterprises as a solution to poverty and some of the world's biggest problems, and we we share that. Um, and when I say he's fearless, I mean I don't think there are many people out there who would be willing to jump on this bandwagon with me. And yet, when I you know when I was when I started down this road, I was looking for a partner. It was very hard. I mean, I put the call out to a couple of universities and tried to reach out to people and say, this is what I'm working on. Do you want to come join me? And, you know, of course, it's very hard to get people excited. I called Mario and uh, he said, let me think about it. And, you know, within a day, he got back to me and he said, yes, I'm on board. Okay, now, uh, entrepreneurialism in the past, mm -hmm. probably 20 years ago, there's no way this could have worked because it yeah. would have taken too long to have been able to communicate with your partner several thousand miles away yeah. about a project several thousand more miles away. <laughs> but today it's different. It's, it's fabulous. I mean, I don't think we'd have been able to do it. But, you know, uh, Mario and I uh, communicate three or four times a day at least um, by Skype. WhatsApp, so we both have our phones out and we have this little app that we text each other. Um, email, of course, and um, a and we save every, nothing is saved on our computers. Everything is on, on Dropbox. So we have access to the same documents. We're editing and sharing ideas and sharing information. And, um, and you know, before going to India on this fellowship, I, I would never have thought that this could work. And when I realized it really doesn't matter where you are. Um, so if you're, if for all the, all the building of the foundation that we've been doing, it's worked out beautifully. We, I, I don't, I, I actually don't feel like there's been any loss of quality from well, being so far. So I was going to ask you that. What's, uh, you know, What's the tough parts of having a partner several thousand miles away about a project again that's several thousand more miles away? Um, you know, so um, so Mario and I actually went through uh, Fledge, which is an incubation program for for startups that want to have a social impact, and it's um, based here in Seattle. And um, we applied for it, and we were accepted. And so Mario came out from Colombia, and he spent two and a half months working, we work together every day for eight or nine hours sitting side by side. Um, that was that was critical, I think, in, in building the base, which allows us to now go forward and do everything else and do it all remotely. Um, I think in today's environment, I work out of um, a co two co-working spaces. Um, one is the hub in Pioneer Square in Seattle, and the other is Office Nomads in Capitol Hill, also Seattle. Um, and so you, you know, and where does uh, Mario work? Mario works, uh, I think, f from home, but mm -hmm. I think he works, he pretty much works anywhere and anytime, mm -hmm. whereas I love the community around me and I love having people to talk to and exchange ideas with, and so I do that. So I personally feel that I don't, I haven't lost <laughs> anything in this mm -hmm. setup. The, the fact that you don't have an office on the top of, uh, a, you know, a, a penthouse office, it's not something that you don't miss? No, I, I, the, these are two beautiful office spaces that I do work out of, and so, um, so I, I don't, I, you know, I'm blessed. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm asking you the entrepreneurial question. What yeah. would a physical office do for you uh, for yours and Mario's business? Uh, well, I, um, you know, when I try to compare what we um, achieved while we were at Fledge working together mm -hmm. and what we achieve um, uh, over time, and I think maybe the difference is that uh, maybe there's a there's a delay in 
the production of the output because you know we go back and forth instead of sitting side by side and saying you know looking at the same screen and comparing notes mm -hmm. so but this way though you can't spill coffee on each other's paper it's true it's true and, but the delay is 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 very slight it's a very slight delay and so again i think the losses are very minimal mm -hmm. and we know also that when we go to india we're going to again be working side by side and setting up these things and um you know, uh, I again, I, I think it's 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 going to be a great journey. You went through some entrepreneurial education, if you will, through Fledge. Yes. Uh, so give us the the three floor elevator pitch about uh, what you learned at Fledge. So over ten weeks um, and exposure to I don't know how many fantastic mentors. Uh, what we learned was uh, essentially, um, you know, how to how to make a great pitch. <laughs> You know, it's all about storytelling. We're humans are storytellers. We like to hear a good story. Um, and then we built our business model. Um, but to me, th those were not, yes, those were some of the valuable outputs. But to me, the, the lesson was really entrepreneurs m make things up a lot as they go. There's no, there's, there, there are no, templates that you can follow for your particular business. Um, and the way I think Mario and I approach this is that we do what we believe. Like I, I really am trying to stay true to what I believe is the right way to do business, you know, to be transparent. What, what is that? Yeah, to be, to be transparent, um, to be, um, um, you know, to be, uh, to have consciousness of the people and the environment that make up or are that are affected by your business mm -hmm. and so to really have uh, focus on that you know the triple bottom line people environment economy well so what are you trying to do with tonsa clean are you are you trying to heal the sick are you trying to clean up the environment are you trying to provide economic opportunity uh, is it one of those three or a it, combination or we focused on one of them which is uh, uh, reducing the amount of of pollution that's entering the environment. Mm -hmm. And we're doing that because for us, because you know, a lot of it is how, how can you measure your impact? Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to measure impact because there are so many factors at play in health and environment and economy. What we can say is we've kept out you know, X, thou X thousands of cubic yards or, or cubic meters of waste out of rivers and streams. Yeah, I think you, uh, you've you got a fact in here that 70 rivers in India can no longer support aquatic life due yes. to yes. the defecation and... and yes, uh, because of fecal contamination. Wow. Yeah, so, um, and we have a lot of rivers in India, but 70 rivers that, that just do not have enough dissolved oxygen to support aquatic life, um, that's something we should be very concerned about. So that's why we well, focused... Well, if you don't turn that around, it's going to be 71 soon and 72, and it's going to exactly. continue on. And so we, we <clears> focused <throat> on that one one aspect of it because it is measurable. Um, and um, But at the same time, um, we want to operate as a business, uh, which is that we want it to be a financially viable mechanism of, um, of managing the sanitation situation. So mm -hmm. yes, we want to have this big social and environmental impact. But when it comes down to it, we want also to be financially viable. Who's your customer? The biodigester. Um, and the reason that we think this will work is because um, uh, currently um, biomass, so all kinds of you know, agricultural waste um, that does get put into these digesters, um, uh, a lot of digesters actually have to pay for it uh, and a market has been created for biomass because um, there was a, a big push at, at, uh, a couple of years ago to set up power plants that run on biomass. And so it's created a lot of demand for biomass. And so mm -hmm. that's driven up the price, which means that, um, that if we can bring in another type of, of biomass, then, um, and we peg it maybe a little bit lower price than, the, than agricultural waste, we have a saleable product. So very, very simple business, supply and demand. Yes. Wow. Um, all right. So if you're an entrepreneur, you've made a, a pitch to investors. What have the investors' responses been? You know, uh, 
we have not, we've spoken to a lot of people in the investment world and to foundations, um, and everyone wants to see a proof of concept. And I don't blame them. I want to see a proof of concept, mm -hmm. which is why we have chosen to, um, we want to run a pilot, mm -hmm. we want to demonstrate that this is viable, and that's why we've chosen um, to go with a crowdfund, go down the crowdfunding route. Mm -hmm. um, we want to raise money essentially from people who care about this. Um, and I'm, every time we get a contribution, I'm blown away that people care about it to make a contribution. Well, wait a minute, though. I mean, people should care about saving the lives of children. I mean, they, yeah. they say that they do. Yeah. Uh, people should care about saving the environment. Again, 70 rivers is going to be 71 soon, and then 72. Yes. And it's not going to be just in India, because right. those rivers flow somewhere. Right. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, intuitively, you, you would think that. But, but I'm asking for people to share their hard-earned dollars and hard-earned money with me, and I'm very respectful mm -hmm. that they choose of all the things that they could be focusing on, they are choosing to, to make the contribution and they want to see a change. And I'm, and, I, and I'm you know, so grateful that they actually see that this impact is not just in India. Um, and I think that this impact is not just in India because the, the problem of fecal pollution entering the environment is very large in India, but India is not the only country that suffers it. Yeah. Around the developing world, um, this is a problem. And if we can create a model, then this is a highly replicable model. So it doesn't have to just stay in India. It can go to every other developing nation. And maybe, just maybe, um, municipalities in the US will say, hey, we do not want to pay for this big centralized wastewater treatment plants. They're expensive. It's expensive to maintain a sewer system. Maybe we want this dispersed model where we're actually not just treating, we're transforming and creating energy. From an entrepreneurial standpoint, you have just answered a great big, huge question, and that's scalability. And um, that was why we pursued this particular route. Yeah, we want it to be scalable. We only have about 30 seconds left. I, I wish we had a lot more time, but well, what do you think is the barriers to success for you? Many barriers. Um, I think one is to be able to prove that this is actually a saleable product. And we're not going to be able to do that if if they don't get enough gas output. So we're going to have to test that. Um, we're going to have to see if uh, truck drivers will deliver on the schedule that the biodigester needs it. Mm -hmm. And um, we think that's where the incentive comes into play. And there are a few other things, but um, we're going to learn as we go and set up this pilot and figure it out. Well, can we ask you a big favor? Yes. Can, can we follow what you do and then you come back and report? I would love to. I would love to share the experiences and learnings from this journey. Well, we're going to do that then. Anisha, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much. Wow. Be sure to follow this. Follow us. Follow what happened because uh, a scalable project of this kind that serves so many people and can save lives, wow, that's really something. Take care. Rainmaker believes we can change the world. One life, one heart, one soul, one mind at a time.